Bienvenue à la session scientifique du département de médecine familiale de l'Université d'Ottawa. La session se veut bilingue. Vous êtes invité à poser vos questions dans la langue de votre choix. Bonne session. Cette présentation sera enregistrée et est disponible sur la chaîne YouTube du département de médecine familiale. En poursuivant la session, vous consentez à être enregistré si votre caméra ou microphone est activé. This session is being recorded and will be posted on the Department of Family Medicine YouTube channel. By continuing the session, you are consenting to be recorded if your camera or microphone is activated. Nous sommes réunis aujourd'hui à partir de nombreux endroits différents et dans un espace virtuel. Mais nous désirons commencer par reconnaître les terres sur lesquelles se trouve le département de médecine familiale de l'Université d'Ottawa, qui font partie du territoire traditionnel non cédé du peuple Anishinaabe algonquin. Nous vous invitons à réfléchir à votre propre emplacement au Canada par rapport au territoire où vous vous trouvez aujourd'hui. Nous reconnaissons aussi les gardiens des savoirs traditionnels, jeunes et âgés. Nous honorons leurs courageux dirigeants d'hier, d'aujourd'hui et de demain. Akonongum egawi kad ki migwewaj. Nimanajianig kakina anishnabeg undaje kaye ugug kakina eneagizijig ene kukamikak kanadang eje udapinagig endawajin udawang. We are gathered today from many different locations and in a virtual space but we wish to begin by recognizing the land on which the Department of Family Medicine at the University of Ottawa is located, which is part of the traditional unceded territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin people. We invite you to think about your own location in Canada in relation to the territory where you find yourself today. We also acknowledge the traditional knowledge keepers, both young and old, and we honor their courageous leaders past, present and future. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to uh, Family Medicine Grand Rounds, our April edition. We have two fabulous speakers lined up, uh, Dr. Nathan Charletti and uh, Dr. Frank Neufeld. So um, we'll begin with uh, Nathan. I'll just give a short introduction, and then, Nathan, the floor will be yours. So Dr. Nathan Charletti is a second-year family medicine resident uh, at from Winchester, and uh, he has implemented multiple green initiatives at the Ottawa Hospital and also at the Winchester District Memorial Hospital and has begun an environmental committee at Winchester Memorial Hospital to optimize greenhouse gas emissions. He's presented to medical students numerous times about the link between climate change and healthcare. And way back uh, a couple of years ago, uh, Nathan was the recipient of uh, the Green Dragon's Den uh, that the department uh, um, had uh, put on. Um, this is, I guess, when you were still a medical student, I think, uh, Nathan. So anyways, looking forward to your presentation. Welcome. As mentioned, my name is Nathan Charlie. I'm a second year uh, rural family medicine resident from Winchester. I'm super excited to present um, RF MRSP project on behalf of my co-resident Zach Graves and my co-authors, Dr. Chris Lavoie and Dr. Ryan Reed. Cutting the paper, does ETP use or exam table paper use mitigate the risk of disease transmission in a family medicine clinic? Before I jump into the presentation, this is a brief outline of what I'll be going over today. i uh, start off by giving a bit of background information. Okay. Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, Nathan, we oh, can hear okay. loud and clear, yeah. Oh, okay, perfect. Sorry, I thought I heard something. I thought I did too. Yeah. Oh, okay, all good. Um, jump into the methodology, review some of the results, uh, and then critically go over some limitations and some take-home points that you can expect. So why do we care about healthcare and climate change? I think for a long time, many Canadians have been ignorant uh, or oblivious to the effects of climate change, but from the forest fires out west to the flooding out east, and the increase of uh, heat-related illnesses and, and uh, tick-borne disease in our own backyard, there's no denying the intimate and intricate relationship our warming planet has on our healthcare system. Now, this is so important because at one point or another, most of the people in this room took an oath of primum non nocere, 
uh, which is first, do no harm. But we know that in Canada, our healthcare system is responsible for nearly 5% of our greenhouse gas emissions. On one hand, we're treating a lot of the comorbidities and chronic conditions that are common in family practice, like heart failure and COPD, asthma, diabetes. But on another, our healthcare system is actually exacerbating these chronic conditions. As Dr. Archibald mentioned, when I was a, a medical stu student, I completed a greenhouse gas analysis. That's just a, a fancy way of saying that I estimated uh, the general hospital's carbon emissions over one year. And in 2020, just the general hospital produced nearly 25,000 tons of CO2 equivalents. Now, it's really tough to put that into you know, tangible numbers. What does that actually mean? Um, but that would be nearly equivalent to what the town of Winchester, where I'm, I'm a resident right now, uh, would expend all of the population in a two-month period. So it is very much reality that our tertiary care centers are much like uh, small villages. Now, there's so many different reasons uh, that the healthcare system has disturbingly high and despairingly high greenhouse gas emissions, but one of those might be excess waste. In 2020, at the general loan, we had nearly 2,000 tons of waste, which equated to about a fifth of our total emissions. And what's really important about waste is that you can't only consider what happens when things leave the building. It's also the, the, the life cycle, the energy intensive process and resources that went into making that. And then actually what goes into making it go away. And as we look to trim down our carbon footprint in family practice, we should really start by identifying, if we're focusing on excess waste, um, behaviors and habits that we could potentially go without and might actually not benefit uh, patient care. I'll be the first to admit these small changes might not move the needle, but small changes equal big change, um, especially when we think that we're um, advocates for the environment, to our patients, to our colleagues, to our partners, to our kids. Um, so we, we, we do have this, this ability. Now, one of those excessive behaviors in family practice or in medicine in general uh, might be the use of exam table paper. For a long time, uh, exam table paper is almost seen as a staple for family physicians, much like Patch Adams here in his white coat, in his stethoscope. Um, it's almost emblematic of a, of a sterile medical environment. Now, everyone's encountered exam table paper at, at one point or another. It's crinkly, it's fragile, it breaks when it's wet. Kids, every time I'm, I'm with a, a kid in, in a room, they find the exam table paper and seem to rip it up. We sometimes draw on it, uh, babies are measured on it. Uh, it's mounted at one end to the other, discarded after single use. As you can see in the in the picture, it covers about 75% of the bed, uh, leaving the sides uncovered. Um, and unfortunately, it actually might hinder proper sanitization. This is coming from uh, a family doctor in Ottawa about four years ago, who said that it actually might promote substandard clinical root, uh, routines while giving a false sense of security to staff and patients regarding infection control. Um, instead, well, actually, I, sh I should mention, interestingly, exam tables shouldn't be, in, in Public Health Ontario's latest guidelines, there's no mention of exam table paper. And instead, low-level disinfectants, such, such as exam tables, should be actually cleaned with 3% hydrogen peroxide, 0.5% accelerated hydrogen peroxide. That's those typical wipes that you often see. Uh, quaternary compounds or, or bleach-like solutions. Now, you might be thinking, what's the big deal? Like, we can't possibly go through that much paper. Now, this is, again, data procured from, from just the general in 2021, um, who purchased about 12,000 uh, or over 12,500 rolls of exam table paper, uh, which produced the disposal and production, uh, just over 14,000 kilograms of CO2 equivalents. For the general, just to offset that amount of um, exam table paper use in one year, we would need to plant 86 trees to fully offset just that carbon emission cost. And it was that realization as a med student uh, that really prompted me um, and inspired me to develop this FMRHP project. 
I should mention that as you might imagine, there's not a ton of uh, studies or prior prior research out there examining this this type of um, this type of intervention or, or product. Um, so I had to get a little bit creative. There was only one study based out of South Africa in, in Johannesburg um, that tracked massage therapists uh, like contact where they place their hands on on patients' back. Otherwise, there's not a a ton of uh, a ton of literature available. Now, in lieu of contaminating the exam tables with uh, a harmful pathogen or bacteria, we use glow germ. Glow germ is essentially this fluorescent-based uh, like lotion that you can rub on your hands naked to the, uh, or you can't see it to the naked eye, but when you put a black UV light under it, um, it becomes quite bright. I have some pictures which, I, which I'll share. Um, in that one previous study that I mentioned, they actually used this as a, as a surrogate um, for contact uh, born illnesses or contact transferred in illnesses, I, I should uh, say. We had six participants uh, from our family medicine clinic who underwent multiple common exams uh, typically seen in, in primary care. So the three exams were a hip knee, an abdominal exam, and a cardio rasp. Participants were brought into the exam room by uh, myself or my co-resident uh, instructed to apply a nickel-sized amount of glow germ to their hands, rub their hands together, uh, and sit in a seat adjacent to the exam table and wait for a physician instruction. I we fully recognize that you know people might not have behaved as normally as they were they would naturally if since they had some lotion in their hands, but we instructed them to to act as naturally as possible in an effort to stimulate a, a normal patient encounter. And the physician then entered the room uh, after being a, given a, a short prompt about what exam to complete, completed the exam. And after that, the physician left the room, followed by the patient who washed their hands uh, and left the room. After each patient encounter, pictures were taken of the exam table um, to demonstrate where the handprints were left on the table. The table was then wiped using a 0.5% accelerated hydrogen peroxide wipe, like the typical Oxivir ones that we would have in the hospital. And the blue light was, or the black UV light uh, was shone again to make sure that we got all of the glow germ off of the, the, the bed. The procedure was repeated with and without exam table paper. So if the patients came in the first time and there was um, paper on the bed, they would repeat the exact same uh, exact same condition, I suppose, without paper the second time. The number of hand touches on the area of the exam table covered with paper and the area of the exam table not covered with paper were tallied uh, and then compared using uh, paired sample t-tests. Um, and we also counted or we also uh, um, ran analysis for both hand touches I should mention hand touches that touched both the exam table paper that was like the, the paper itself in the area uncovered were given a, a point for each uncovered and covered. Um, now onto the, onto the results. This is just a, a brief uh, picture about kind of what you could expect from each of the conditions. So you can clearly see the, the glow germ um, quite brightly with the, the black UV light. Without the light, it was um, completely... Uh, unappreciable. And you can see again that the exam table uh, paper covers about 75% of the bed, leaving about 12.5% on, on each side. Now, this is the, the crux of our findings. I, I want to orient you to the, the first graph. Um, the number of touches we have on your, your y-axis. Um, we have this condition with exam table paper. So these are the, the exams with the exam table paper. In the blue, we have the section of the exam table paper that's covered, so with the paper. And then we have in orange the paper or the, the section that's uncovered. And you can clearly see that uh, people touched the areas uncovered by the exam table paper statistically significantly more than, than they did with the, uh, the area that was covered. Now you might think, okay, maybe it was just the thought of the exam table um, paper being there that prompted them to, to potentially avoid it. Well, this is the condition without the exam table paper. You might think like, well, how could you possibly have 
um, a section of exam table covered this blue bar if there's no paper on the bed. And very simply, we just estimated where the, uh, we like measured out where the exam table paper would cover uh, and repeated the procedure. And essentially there's, there's similar findings from uh, the condition with the exam table paper with them without it as well. Uh, and this, this really shows that you know, based on these, these results, it certainly doesn't seem to be doing enough uh, exam table paper, that is, to justify its ongoing use, given that the participants touch the area of the table uncovered by the paper statistically significantly more than the area that was actually covered. Now, there's a couple different main findings that, that I want to touch on. First, I mean, the, the elephant in the room, I suppose, is the, the main findings are the is the touch discrepancy. Now, it's fair to repeat it again. We found that the participants touched the uncovered areas of the table more often than the larger, significantly larger covered areas. Um, during exams and like intuitively, when we go into rooms, we often notice patients will sit on the bed. They'll be oftentimes fully clothed. They'll wrap their hands around the side of the bed or under the bed. If they lie down, their, their palms will be touching the bare aspects of the bed. And oftentimes, if we don't wipe the bed down, we just tear the exam table uh, paper off, which was completely covered by the patient's clothes anyways. Um, this, you know, clearly can, you, you, you might be able to appreciate that um, these findings would give rise and evidence to people falsely perceiving the sterility of using the bed when people are just touching the sides of it um, and missing these high contact areas. Now I'm, uh, you know, remiss not to mention the environmental and economic uh, impacts of of mitigating or lessening our our exam table paper use um, from a clinic that uses uh, about 150 exams requiring exam table paper per week. So which isn't out of the realm in, in some of the larger groups. Uh, that's about three rolls of exam table paper, uh, which would yield a carbon footprint of around 200. Uh, kilograms of CO2 equivalent to offset that output annually for that fictitious clinic, which again, isn't out of the realm. Uh, nine mature trees would have to be planted just for that clinic. And the savings economically would be about uh, 85 to 90 bucks, depending on, on a week, 85 to $90 a week, depending on price points. So not insignificant again. Uh, there's some obvious limitations to our study that I, I certainly want to touch on. Um, one would be our small homogenous sample size. Um, there's no getting around it. We had six people. Uh, they were all from our, our, our office. Um, but despite this, we were still able to see significant differences in, in participant behavior. And I should mention that we may have even seen more, uh, more of a difference if we applied the glow germ to the back of the hands or the forearms as well, um, just because that's kind of typical of, of patient behavior. Uh, additionally, although participants weren't informed about the exam table paper portion of the study, they were made aware that this was a study to assess germ transfer in a family medicine clinic, which could have impacted their behavior. I'll be the first to admit that, um, you know, when patients come in for the first condition, <laughs> there's paper on the bed or there's no paper on the bed. And then the second time they come in, it's the exact same thing. And there's, you know, paper or not paper. So um, that certainly could have altered their, their perception as well as, you know, using the glow germ and interacting in their environment with perceived lotion on their hands. Although I should mention that the authors in the, in the prior study that, um, that I discussed in the background uh, were adamantly, um, or I guess, stated that it, that wasn't one of the reasons that they believed uh, participant behavior could have been altered. Um, for, the, for the simplicity of our, our study, we deemed all touches to be equal. Um, so what I mean by that is uh, we couldn't really quantify patient uh, like contact times, which I think would have been a, a really interesting perspective. I struggled with this before when I was thinking up the methodology and um, alternatively I was going to swab the beds to, to see what you know bacteria burden or viral burden was on and it 
quickly for obvious reasons got a little bit out of hand. Um, but I, I just want to recognize that in clinical practice, longer contact times may result in, in uh, longer potential contact periods for disease transmission. Um, so making certain conclusions based on just the touches themselves may be misleading because not all touches potentially would be equal. Um, future research could investigate the link between these contact times and contact transmission, especially, especially, especially in procedures which may produce bodily fluids. And this is a, like a super, super important caveat. A lot of the resistance I, I hear often is about uh, implementing these in digital rectal exams, genitalia exams, speculum exams, um, any type of exam that might produce blood, like a cortisone injection. Uh, in those specific exams, along with, say, um, newborns or the elderly where incontinence might be an issue, using ETP or exam table paper, I should say, um, or reusable cloth sheets may help stop the transmission of, of bodily fluids and honestly just make patients feel a little more comfortable. Um, but look, the caveat being if clinicians or, or practitioners choose to use exam table paper in these instances, then a small segment could be used. Um, additionally, just based on the results of this study, laying it horizontally instead of vertically might be an, might be a reasonable option. Um, and in those clinics that have eliminated the, the use completely exam table paper, uh, providing uh, signage or asking people to bring in their own um, sheets or barriers is, is has certainly made that transition a, a lot uh, a lot more simple. Now, where are some of the conclusions and, and project outcomes that I just want to um, discuss with you briefly? Uh, I think, you know, hopefully just hearing this small, small uh, proof of concept study, you know, you might think secondly about um, just putting it on and ripping it off for every single patient encounter. In our clinic uh, in Winchester, um, we have it on the bed, like uh, wrapped to the end of the head of the bed. But if we need it, we can roll it off. Um, and then if you know we use the bed, uh, my personal practice is just to wipe it, wipe it off. It takes about ten seconds. Um, and hopefully that that can be common practice if if you think that that's a a reasonable alternative. Um, super proud to announce that obviously we. Um, this manuscript, this project uh, is impressed for the Annals of Family Medicine. So hopefully that will just get the advocacy and, and the word out about, about this issue. And then I spoke about this numerous times. Um, just from a project outcome perspective, uh, there's a lot of things that we as residents do for this FMRSP project. I'm just so happy to be able to share um, some of these uh, deliverables, especially with Trashcan. That's a, a resident-led environmental initiative. CFMS, that's a group of medical students who has a sustainability focus. So I've, I've shared this presentation with them uh, both. And then numerous resources. I'm, I should have put it in the chat earlier. I will put it in the chat after. Uh, resources to implement uh, the mitigation of exam table paper. That's appropriate signage, uh, infographs for, for people as well. Now, uh, hopefully I, I've done enough to at least have you second guess uh, constantly using the exam table paper um, for for each of our um, for each of our physical exams. Um, and I just want to give a quick, quick shout out to our volunteers who are absolutely fantastic um, and for diversity uh, for their continual support in this project. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm happy to take questions at this time. Nathan, thank you so much. That was uh, very well done. And uh, just to say, yeah, um, great proof of concept, right? I'm not so worried about the numbers here. And so I, I, I'll start the questions off if you don't mind. And then I can see that there's a very good comment in the chat to, uh, to consider. Um, as it was a proof of concept, um, most important would be sort of lessons learned or what you may do differently if you were to scale this up. And have you given any thought to what you would do differently if you were to scale this? Yeah, I think there, there's a couple of thoughts that I have. Um, the first being, and assuming that I have an unlimited budget, it, it was something that I initially wanted to do was uh, swab the beds. I, I, I mentioned this in the presentation, but I think it actually might be worthwhile is swabbing the beds for viral loads um, and uh, and just seeing 
you know, that that's like more of a quantitative, um, I guess, conclusion to the spread of disease. And, you know, even if we have the exam table paper there, is it really preventing much? So that's one thing. If I had an unlimited budget and unlimited time, uh, something I would certainly mm -hmm. consider. The second would be uh, something, again, I, I kind of mentioned was um, if it were to use glow germ in the future, putting them on multiple areas that people touched and also kind of scaling up where other people touch in high contact areas. In our clinic, that's the um, like area beside the, the chair that they get their blood pressure on. Maybe we should be wiping that down as well. Um, yeah, those, those would be some things that I would, I potentially spitball, especially though, looking at those sensitive exams. Thank you. So if, if you could, uh, if we could address the question in the chat from Deborah, and this has to do with patient perceptions, Yeah. were there any concerns or comments around not using the paper around cleanliness? In our, I guess in the project or as we've kind of phased things out, I, well, both maybe. Yeah. It, in the project, it wasn't really um it wasn't really something that got brought up i think it was just because everyone was kind of just focused on whatever they were asked to do um in the clinic though surprising unless they complain to other people i haven't heard uh, one thing personally um and we don't really actually i shouldn't say we don't really we don't have signage in our clinic other clinics that have phased this out like dr samantha green um she works out the gta and other clinics in hamilton uh, they've actually put signage up and they said that that's been really well responded to. Um, so certainly for some of the more sensitive exams where you might actually have like a bare bottom on the exam table, certainly having that exam table paper is reasonable. But I was listening and it was a really, really nice presentation. Thank you so much. I learned so much from it. My question um, is related to uh, the use of cavi wipes. So currently in our clinic, we um, we have the paper, the exam paper, and since COVID, we started using the cavi wipes to do a, a thorough cleaning of the bed and of the table and the chair where the patient is sitting. So I'm I'm thinking that so, okay, so we're doing too much, and the paper is is kind of useless from what I'm learning from the presentation today. So in terms of footprint and the use, like the use of cavi wipe in comparison to the use of the paper. Um, are we are we doing any good for the environment by using so much cavi wipes as well after each presentation? Um, can you maybe comment a little bit on you know paper versus other ways like um, the cavi wipes and you know is one solution better than the other from the environmental perspective? That is such a good question. Um, I so Dr. Archibald mentioned that I I was. Um, successful in uh, in winning a grant through the Department of Family Medicine a, a couple of years ago when I was a medical student. And I actually ran this analysis. I'm just pulling it up so I don't uh, misquote myself here. Um, so the exam table paper is about four times the amount of a carbon offset versus the disinfectant wipes when I ran the numbers two years ago. Um, and comparing them at, at price point, they're about equal. If you're doing them both, then I mean, it, it means that you're just saving money on the exam table paper. And what I always say is that um, I guess the standard of care would be to use the wipes or to use some type of other disinfectant solution um, for low level disinfectants. So if you're comparing them head to head, like if you're choosing exam table paper or disinfectant wipes, from an environmental perspective, the exam table paper is four times the carbon cost of the wipes and about the same amount of money. Um, so that should kind of hopefully answer your, your question. Go ahead, Bill. Hello, Nathan. Congratulations on a really excellent study. Uh, <clears throat> my question was the same as KN, so I'll just make a comment. Um, but um, I think it's important that in your presentation, you address the uh, environmental impact of the alternative so that people can compare. Um, I wanted to say that I'm not at all fussed about the small sample size. You reach statistical significance. People could make an argument that if you had had a much greater uh, sample size, that that might've been unethical because it was unnecessary. So 
probably a good idea when you're presenting to say, to acknowledge that it's not, because of its small size, there may be other situations that are uh, relevant that you didn't get to address other patient populations or something, but you had enough patients to prove your point. So I'm not fussed about the small sample size and uh, congratulations on a beautiful, smart study. Oh, well, much appreciated, Dr. Og. Thank you. Well, bravo. So thank you very much, Nathan, for your uh, presentation. If anybody has any comments for Nathan, please put them in the chat. We're going to move to our second presenter now, um, Dr. Frank Neufeld, who is an associate professor of the Department of Family Medicine. Um, and he also holds the University of Ottawa Brain and Mind Briere Chair in Family Health Care. Uh, in dementia research, um, and he's also a physician at the Memory Clinic at the Elizabeth Briere Hospital. His research focuses on the use of technology to help older adults age in place. His work includes the use of sensors in support, support of smart homes and to assess driving safety. Um, at AgeWell, Inc., he is the National Challenge Lead for Cognitive Health and Dementia, and he's also the lead author of a recently published book, Supportive Smart Homes. So, Dr. Nofeld, over to you. Thank you for that uh, kind introduction, Doug. And uh, I have to say, following uh, Nathan's presentation is, uh, is a tall order. So I will try and I'll just quickly... Uh, identify that uh, in that spirit of uh, environmentalness, I uh, um, I do have an electric car that I've been driving for six years and we have solar panels on our roof that more than cover the electrical needs of our car and all of our use over the years. So we're trying to do our part too. Fabulous. <laughs> okay, so we are gonna talk about uh, uh, driving simulator today. Day. And uh, of course, I want to acknowledge the funding of the chair position. Uh, in this case, the Canadian Foundation for Innovation paid for our driving simulator. Our practice plan uh, supported a lot of this work. And of course, I only represent one member of a, of a large team that is doing driving research. Uh, Meg is our research assistant. We have engineers, uh, Bruce and Rafiq. We have physicians, Sean Marshall, Neil Thomas, Andrew Frank, and then psychologists, all part of the team. Conflict of interest, I do have some disclosures, but they're in the home technology space, so they don't have any uh, impact on the presentation. So what I'm hoping to talk to you about is just a quick recap on aging and cognition, sort of what happens as we age, um, cognition and driving, uh, talk about the dri different driving assessments that are happening now, then focus a little bit on some data, some early, early data of our uh, uh, simulator. And uh, maybe if I have time at the end, talk about some of the current research we're into. And yeah, one of my favorite driving pictures uh, from the Dukes of Hazard, of course. So aging in cognition, I just want to disclose, I'm not a big fan of the term dementia. I used it for 20 years. I try not to use it anymore because it comes from mens, which is mind, and then demens, meaning mindless. And that might have worked in ancient Rome, but probably isn't a good term to use today and certainly doesn't apply to any of my patients. Um, the way I look at cognition and aging is sort of three intersecting circles. So you can age with minimal cognitive and minimal functional decline. You can age with cognitive decline, which is certainly measurable, but minimal functional decline, what's you know commonly referred to as mild cognitive impairment. And then you can age with cognitive decline and functional decline, um, so-called dementia. And like I said, I won't be using that term. Um, so just to talk a little bit about aging of the brain. So at the macroscopic level, we know that with age, uh, brain the brain atrophies, we can see on scans microvascular changes. And of course, injuries would accumulate over time. Um, you know, subdural hematoma is obviously visible, neural pressure of hydrocephalus. The importance, of course, of that is at the level of the circuitry. 
Um, we have decreased connections with aging, dendrites, uh, axons, uh, et cetera, and of course, cell death. At the metabolic level, there's inflammation, anoxia, accumulation of toxins, impact of infection and medication. And then there's sort of the structural changes. Uh, we can have you know, changes at the membrane level, including the ionic channels. Neurotransmission is affected the way we produce and receive um, neurotransmitters. The synapses change over time. And of course, there's the famous misfolded proteins, uh, tau and amyloid. And, you know, if we look at it again at the brain level, we know that different parts of the brain have different cognitive domains associated with them. And we know with aging, there are changes in short-term memory, language ability, speed of processing is quite significant, the changes with aging, um, and executive functioning changes, uh, reasoning, autocritic, uh, correction, those kinds of things are all, um, and we'll get back to why they're relevant for driving. Um, so uh, just to recap, the law in Ontario is that we are to report any person that has any kind of condition that we think can impact their driving ability. And in fact, the law states that it's not even only for people with that have a driver's license. So it's any person technically we're supposed to uh, notify the ministry. Of course, most of us notify people that actually have an active driver's license. Just to recap what we need for driving on the physical side, of course, we need to be able to see and hear. We need to have mobility, good mobility of our neck, arms, and legs. We need to get oxygen and uh, nutrients uh, to, the, to the brain. And so heart and lungs need to be in, intact. And of course, the brain needs to be functioning so we can't have seizures and that kind of thing going on. And specifically for cognitive domains, um, executive functioning is really important. Um, for instance, trip planning, multitasking, um, adapting to the traffic around us. And here's someone who's not so much uh, adapting. Um, and of course, we have visual spatial abilities that are very important. So keeping the lane, um, the distance to the next vehicle, um, parking between vehicles, left-hand turns into oncoming traffic, these are all visual spatial uh, pieces. Memory is not that important for driving. However, I would say that recently with uh, the changes in our vehicles and the increasing complexity, memory is more important. Anyone that has ever tried uh, um, to rent uh, a Tesla and having never driven a Tesla would know what I mean. There, are, Everything is different and you really do need uh, about a week to, to get to learn how to make that thing work. Um, language ability is, uh, again, not super essential. However, we do need to understand the signage um, and we need to understand when our car communicates with us uh, if there's a particular message about something going wrong. So those are the impacts. Um, and um, just to recap that with aging, we sort of have this feed forward loop, right? So let's say you have cataracts, that's a functional loss affecting vision. So you, things are a bit blurrier when you're driving at night, so you're not as confident driving at night. So maybe you avoid driving at night, so you decrease the kilometers that you're driving. But then by that, you're, of course, losing your skills in driving at night, which then increases your loss of confidence, et cetera. And you can see this is a feed-forward loop, and eventually people do stop driving uh, just by disuse. And uh, so... This is um, data regarding crashes by age. Why are we interested in the aging driver? This is why. Um, so the dark line is a fatal crashes by kilometer driven. The dotted line is simply crashes by kilometer driven. And so you can see the younger drivers, as we all know, a um, little bit riskier, their driving style. So they're more likely to crash than, than sort of the middle agers. Um, and uh, because they're going so fast and they lose so much control, a lot of them do die um, in their crashes. When we get to the older population, sort of 75 and up, again, we start having more crashes per kilometer driven. But we see the spike in deaths per um, kilometer driven as well, because, of course, we're talking about frailer older adults and they just don't survive crashes the way uh, middle-agers would. Um, again, why is this 
cognition and driving important. This is data um, about the increase in the number of drivers in Ontario um, with um, cognitive impairment with functional decline. So what is commonly referred to as dementia, right? So these are numbers and you can see that there's sort of a steady increase. And by 2030-ish, we'll have 100,000 older Ontarians with significant cognitive impairment with an active driver's license. Um, you know, I'm sort of focusing on the, the badness of driving, but let's talk about the goodness of driving. We know there, there's very significant impact on people when they lose their driver's license. There's social isolation, which leads to depression. Um, ironically, by taking away someone's car, we typically decrease the amount of exercise they end up doing. So um, instead of walking to the grocery store, they stop going to the grocery store, so they actually don't walk in the store, which is part of this, the exercise that they're getting. And we know that there is a direct consequence on cognition. So ironically, the cognition is the reason I give for why um, we're suspending someone's license, and yet I am in fact worsening their cognitive abilities by um, decreasing their exercise and, their, and isolating them socially. So not uh, for the faint of heart. Um, we did some research on driving cessation at the memory clinic. We looked at uh, a number of uh, people. We contacted them six months after they had, had had their license suspended, and we published this in geriatrics. Um, this is just one quote um, from a partner, the wife of a patient. It was a shock to me. We weren't prepared. I was shocked by that decision right then and there. I didn't see it coming. And then I had to deal with his feelings. I couldn't see what our future was going to be. I was just trying to take care of him. And then he was so angry. And I couldn't see the next week in the calendar. I was just living in that moment. And the moment was awful. So just to be clear, um, and this is one of my patients, right? And this is <laughs> my their reaction to me, my, my clinical decision making, right? Um, so uh, yeah, it, this is this is serious when we do suspend someone's uh, license. Um, and just to talk about um, an other work that Amy and I have done, uh, we were looking at uh, fifty patients from the memory clinic that were ref referred to the Ministry of Transport to fifty that were not, and uh, not not unexpectedly, the trails B weighed heavily on that. Um, the abnormal clock did. Um, typically, the, the the group that was suspended was older. We were a little surprised at the difference in uh, cognitive testing um, because we're not supposed to use cognitive scores um, to predict driving risk, but there is an association. The new finding was really about the number of functional impairments. So if you have a cognitive decline and functional decline, um, you're more likely to have your license suspended. And it makes sense. If you have difficulty changing channels on your TV remote, um, you, might, you might have difficulty driving uh, as well. Um, driving assessments, what's being done right now? Of course, you may have heard about the Ministry of Transport screening. So at 80, 82, 84, and so on, active drivers have to go to the uh, center. They do a clock drawing. Um, they do some vision testing. Um, that's the size of it. Um, you know that there's cognitive tests. I talked about them earlier. The ones that are most strongly associated with driving risk are the trails B and the clock drawing. Of course, the gold standard right now is on road testing. Um, and we're looking at, you know, emerging possibilities of driving simulators and naturalistic driving um, for future driving assessments. And again, the trails B, most of you would know what that looks like. And here's an example of a clock of one of my patients. And then you can see how, you know, executive functioning is, is quite impaired in this person. So, um, you know, risk of driving. So this is a picture of our driving simulator uh, at Briere here on the second floor. Um, and you see it's got uh, three giant screens and it's a pretty realistic looking uh, scenery. Um, you see that the driving uh, air seat is actually from a car. Uh, the whole dash um, gears are from an actual car uh, ripped out of a GM. 
And uh, so it's as realistic as possible, seat belt and, and so on. Um, the whole platform of moves um, to simulate some of the feelings in the car when you accelerate and decelerate to make it as realistic as possible. So now I'm going to present some of our early data. The first thing is driving a simu or simulator sickness. Um, we knew this was going to be a thing, but we had no idea how bad it was going to be. In fact, six of our first nine participants had to stop um, due to simulator sickness. We could not finish the um, battery that we had uh, created uh, for, the, for, for two thirds of participants. Our first 60 participants, four were sick enough to throw up. Um, so it's real. Um, we have been working hard to adjust things on the simulator, the motion, the seeing the hood on the screen, adjusting the steering wheel, adjusting the brakes, um, the visual stream on the side, uh, tinting out the windows. We've done a lot of work. And our research assistant is much more aggressive in slowing people down because for some reason, once people are in it, they don't want to stop, even though they're getting more and more nauseous. So we, we're much more aggressive in stopping the trial now. Um, so we're now on our fifth protocol uh, with maximum choice for the participants. So we do little modules. We give them feeling. This is what it feels like when it moves. This is what it feels like when it doesn't move. This is tinted. This is untinted. And we give people choices on how they're most comfortable driving. The simulator sickness questionnaire is the tool that we use. Each of these items is scored uh, from zero to two. Um, and so there's sort of general discomfort, fatigue, headache, sweating, um, vision stuff, um, concentration, dizziness, vertigo, and then sort of physical symptoms, salivation, nausea, stomach awareness, burping, um, all scored uh, zero to two. And these are our data from the first uh, um, sort of 80 participants. And so we did this simulator sickness score at the beginning. If you came in feeling nauseous, we needed to know you were already nauseous, right? So um, a baseline. And then after, well, there were five points in the, in the trial where we did the simulator sickness. And uh, you can see our very first protocol, we had this massive increase in simulator sickness scores. So we adjusted things. And if this is the difference between the first and the fifth simulator sickness score, and you can see we've sort of been steadily creeping down on the amount um, of uh, simulator sickness that, that we're causing through the trials. So here's our first data. This is again is normative data. So we took um, healthy population of uh, Canadians, of Ottawans, and we looked at a number of different things. So the first thing is the driving simulator allows us to do sort of what I would call one or two dimensional testing. Not complete, it certainly has complete driving, but what we did is we said, well, let's see if these modules that do individual things are helpful. So we did um, a reaction time test where essentially your foot is on the gas and then the light changes and you hit the brake. And it's simply a one dimensional reaction time. And you can see with increasing age, um, our reaction time is slower, which fits with that speed of processing thing we were talking about. And all of these differences are statistically significant, not be between the youngest and the oldest, between the young old and the old old drivers. This is a dual task. And so you don't know if you're gonna have to stop or if you're gonna have to turn. And so it takes a little longer for you to process what you do next. Um, and again, um, big differences uh, between the old old and the young old. There's an intersection, which is just one intersection, and your task, you do it five times. Your task is to cross the intersection. You're at a stop sign. Traffic is going across. Um, cars are going across in front of you, both directions, and there are pedestrians walking on both sidewalks. So it's a question of finding the gap. And uh, so interestingly, the young old were the best at doing this. There's five crossings, and the young old were able to do 4.8 um, crossings that were safe and a couple of near misses on average. Um, but uh, yeah, really good results for that group. Um, there's a module where you're driving through the city and a pedestrian steps out from behind a bus. 
Um, so um, again, you know, we compared all the data and, and there's a number of things that are measured. So I'm just gonna highlight some of them, but um, here the young drivers do the worst as expected. They come in hot. They are the fastest uh, um, when the person steps out in front of uh, from in front of a bus. So they um, break a lot. Um, they skid a lot, um, and they take a while. They cover a lot of distance before they actually start braking because they're going faster. Um, young adults hit the pedestrian eight times. Um, the older adults are a little come in a little slower, and they're less likely to hit the pedestrian. Um, and then there's the on-road test. So like you would have in real life uh, uh, G2, if you like, the um, there is a 15 to 20 minute on-road test um, with various intersections. People do walk out in front of the cars, et cetera. And you're scored on these domains. This is built into the software. So we actually don't control these um, scores. Um, there's complex algorithms that come up with these scores. Uh, so there's a total score. And then there are six domains. The sixth domain is economy. So they help people learn about fuel economy, but it's not included in the total score. So I'm not presenting that data um, today. But just to say that um, on the on-road test, the older old group um, is significantly performing below the young old group um, in and four of those domains, well, the total score in three other domains are statistically significant just by age, normal drivers, licensed drivers, um, they, there's a change. And this is gonna make it challenging to figure out what normal cutoffs are gonna be. Except that sometimes there's really obvious things that happen. So here you have again, the averages for the 20 to 36 group and three drivers that were 26 and 24 and if you look at their scores, uh, I put in red every score that was outside of one standard deviation for their age group. Um, and when we looked at these drivers, it turned out they only had their G1. So they actually didn't have driving experience. They had a driver's license, but not driving experience. And sure enough, you could easily identify that um, as being a risk. Um, and we had one older driver, again, comparing to her age group, um, who scored below um, the one standard deviation on every single domain. Um, this turned out to be someone that had a valid driver's license, but had not driven for seven years. Her partner had died. Um, she had sold the car. And, and so she had an active driver's license, but I'm not sure as a former motorcycle rider if I wanted to be on the same road as her. So just to say outliers are clearly outliers and they don't even have to be, you know, coming out of an accident. Um, they're just uh, inexperienced. So just to highlight some of our other research. Um, so we are wrapping up our normative data study. We've changed the protocol a couple of times. So we have to get a few more higher numbers to get that going. We are doing a, um, a study with the Heart Institute looking at um, chronic uh, arrhythmia and its impact on the brain. Uh, we'll be doing neuropsychological testing um, as well as a driving simulator to see if they're, they're, we can identify changes associated with chronic heart disease. We're working with the CanDrive group. Um, they've developed a tool where they're screening uh, driving risk and uh, we will be looking at some of those drivers on the simulator to see if their scores reflect the can drive tool, where we're doing work with Transport Canada on autonomous vehicles. Because our cars currently are only semi-autonomous, um, those of us who have some of that know that we do have to take over from time to time. But what happens as we age, we lose our skills and we have to take over um, from a car. Uh, we are working with the Canadian Automobile Association. They have um, devices in the cars of their insured drivers that monitor their driving every second. And we have 77,000 drivers uh, of all age groups, um, one full year of driving data. And we've been looking at that, uh, again, to look at changes with age. Um, very interesting uh, data coming out of that work. We are also uh, working with the Ministry of Transport of Ontario, looking at the possibility of including this kind of naturalistic driving data 
in uh, future assessments of older drivers. And uh, like I said, we've been doing work on autonomous cars, thinking about, you know, is there a way of having a graduated license, for instance, where if you have a little bit of difficulty with executive functioning, well, you have to have a semi-autonomous car that does shoulder checks for you, that has, you know, automatic braking assist, et cetera. Um, and, and of course, that's very preliminary work. We are also hoping to do a longitudinal trial of older adults from our memory clinic that have uh, um, cognitive impairment, but no functional impairment and monitoring them over time and see if we can identify changes in driving early on that will help us with uh, future notification of the Ministry of Transport or and or training to help people with mild cognitive impairment to see if we can keep them on the road longer. Um, and yeah, so that was a quick flyover sort of, of, of the work we're doing on, on cognition and driving. And uh, uh, yeah, happy to take uh, questions. Frank, thanks so much. That was a great uh, presentation. Um, I had a, well, my, my question was around the autonomous driving, which I think you addressed in uh, your, your current research. So, uh, you know, that was fabulous. Um, I, I must say that I had similar issues around vertigo when I was doing work um, with uh, virtual reality. And there were a lot of adjustments that had to be made because uh, early on people were getting uh, very nauseous. But it's amazing what you can do to sort of tone things down so um, movements aren't as sensitive. Uh, I guess that was with the steering, right? You could sort of slow things down and stuff. So great that you were able to uh, remedy that. Anyways, I'll open up the uh, the floor for uh, questions. Question. Um, thanks. That was a really good talk um, and a really good overview. We're implementing the Can Drive tool um, at the Family Medicine Clinic at Briere. We've had limited uptake, but I think it's um, it's due to you know we need to promote and educate folks. I think it's definitely something that's worthwhile because it's kind of a you know, an awesome thing to assess somebody's um, driving capabilities, you know, with a 15 minutes of a, you know, of, of an appointment. Uh, so I think like a quick tool to kind of screen is really valuable. Are there other tools available um, worldwide that are validated like the can drive tool? Yeah. I mean, th that's, that's the, the big, challenge right is that this is so important we don't want them to keep driving and hurting themselves or others um, on the other hand we don't want to take the license away too soon because we know we're going to actually deteriorate their aging you know accelerate their aging process by doing the wrong thing so you know how do you do this and um look there are thousands of groups around the world working on this super actively um looking at every bit of driving every bit of cognition to see you know how how to to do this and unfortunately um, there is there is no great way of doing it i'm, I'm going to say that you know a driving simulator will be better for the environment than all these on road testing with real gas burning cars but um you know that's not why we're doing it and necessarily it's it's also you know cheaper and um and of course if you hit someone in a driving simulator no one gets hurt you know but um the i mean there's there's a, now an increasing debate about even if the on road test is actually a, a gold standard just to let give you an idea in toronto um the, the smart students have figured out that if you take your driving test in orangeville um you have a much greater chance of passing than if you do it at the uh, center in downtown toronto because of course it's much messier traffic and everything so there's this huge rush of toronto driving students now taking their on-road test in orangeville when they pass that are they safe to drive in this city i don't know so so you know the driving simulator the nice thing is you can make it standardized something you can't do at a driving school right if you're if you're in Mukmuk Island your driving is going to be there you you can't fake driving on a highway right so um you know there's there's an like in my view driving simulation is much more standardizable um than than an on road test whether to, you know whether time of day um, you know, people jumping out in front of your car, all these things you can't 
do in real life, right? But you can do in driving simulation. So bottom line though, is that right now there is no perfect tool, right? The best tools we have right now the, that have the most um, statistical validity, if you like, is the trails B. So um, less than two minutes is of course a normal score. Two to three minutes is, is slow, but you know, not worse than a teenage driver above three minutes. Um, you know, there's some um, high level evidence that you triple your chance of a car crash. Um, and, but, but that's, but it's not perfect. And adding the clock drawing, I think makes it more robust because then you can see their, how they react to, you know, a complex problem, if you like, and driving is a complex problem. Um, and uh, yeah, so there, yeah, unfortunately, there is no perfect tool. I, I'm curious to see how the can drive tool does. I mean, certainly they have more data than anyone else in the world with their, you know, thousands of drivers uh, over the age of uh, 70. Um, but even the endpoint is a hard question, right? Is the endpoint a crash? Or, you know, it, or is the endpoint um, loss of demerit points? Or, you know, is it a near crash? Like, what do we as a society tolerate um, when it comes to older older drivers? And the answer is we're, we're not even sure about that. So there, right now, I think it's fair to say there are still more questions than there are answers. But research like what you're trying to do, Paul, is really, really important. And being part of that and helping recruit is really important because every bit of information helps you know, us put the puzzle together. Frank, thank you so much. And Nathan as well. Um, great presentations, great conversation. We're at time now. I'd like to wish you all a great day. Thanks so much.